The three of us, Jane Bagley, Linda DeStefano, and myself, Beth Howe Miller, are here at the Women's Information Center in Syracuse, New York. It's June 1st, 2008, and we're just reminiscing about our experiences of a little workshop that we did at the, at the Peace Encampment. And just so you know, Estelle will ask questions, or I'll ask questions. You can, you know, look to either one of us. You don't have to look to the camera, although Susie's very... Or you can ask happy. questions of each other. <laughs> we'll probably be interrupting each other as yeah. we go along. Uh, and are you going to get up and do the dance? <laughs> well, I don't have my partner. Pat Finley isn't here. Oh, that's because I, I, I was going to make sure that... <laughs> so Estelle, is it... No, no, I, yeah, okay. It's just trying to think. I'm just trying to get everybody in without getting your shoulder in. Oh, okay. <laughs> do you want I, to start I can, by giving an overview of what we did and then you each can do part well, of Actually, it. before we start okay. with what you did, I just sure. want to hear a little bit about why you would have, how you heard about the encampment and why you would have done anything to begin with. So a little background about where you were before the encampment started and why you would have been interested in being a part mm -hmm. of it. Well, I was a volunteer at the Syracuse Peace Council. My first husband had worked there. That's why we moved to Syracuse in 1974. And so I was very aware of any peace activities that were going on. And so it was just a natural thing to know about the peace encampment and to want to be part of it in some way. And I was involved with the Peace Council too. And Karen Beadle, who was one of the um, prime members who stayed on the land a long time, um, was living at the time with my son and me, and so we were, um, you know, kept very up to date with her, and it was just a good thing to do. I never actually spent even a night on the encampment, but it was a wonderful, affirming kind of thing to do. And I heard about it from Linda and Shane through our mutual um, involvement with People for Animal Rights. That's how I heard about it and got inspired to participate in this project. And so it was something that, as part of the encampment, somehow you got word that they wanted women to come and share information. How did you know about that? As I recall, our presentation connecting animal rights and peace issues was part of various presentations that were going on that day. I don't remember how specifically we heard about it, do you? No, maybe from Karen. Maybe, yeah. So other people were coming to do... That's my recollection, I think yeah. Probably so, yeah. And you all decided to come do something, and did, was, did you know it was happening in advance, so you prepared something? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah, we have our whole little program here we handed out. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> You have to prepare for doing dancing, <laughs> I mean choreographed dancing. Yes. And poetry. So you, but you had been doing work together and then you decided to somehow take the information, the work, and create a presentation that you were going to give. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well we were working together as members of this organization, People for Animal Rights, which was founded in Syracuse in fall of 1982. Jane and I were co-mothers <laughs> and uh, Beth was involved very early. And uh, we were doing things like, um, I'll just give you one example, demanding that the Beaver Lake Nature Center stop allowing their facilities to be used to teach little boys, like eight-year-old boys, how to trap animals and steal jaw leg hole traps because we thought that was a very inappropriate use of the Nature Center's facilities. And so, you know, we would do some demonstrations and we would talk and negotiate and we worked something out with that. And we would do public presentations in our newsletter, uh, etc. So you had done public presentations prior to the encampment? Well, yes, but it wasn't us doing the presentations. We would bring in a speaker or we would oh, show a okay. video. This was the first time that we were called upon to be the presenters, the performers. <laughs> and did you, any of you have a background in, I'm not sure what you're gonna, you ended up doing, but in public speaking in theater in any kind of that? I had a little bit of background in writing poetry and doing a little bit of theater work, uh, so it was kind of exciting to me to have a chance to express that part of myself in this opportunity. I don't have any training of that sort, but I love dancing, 
And um, and since I'm very passionate about how animals are treated, it was sort of easy to go from poetry about how animals are treated to put that into movement. And I didn't really have an active part in the presentation. You read the poems, right? And introduced the program. That's my recollection. Oh, okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that I did. Jane, I remember some of the beautiful readings that oh. you did. Oh, wow. Well. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, you want to... Are we going to hear this po the poem? Yeah, I, I thought first I would just do an overview of what yeah, we had in the right. program, and then we could uh, each do parts. Excellent, great. Okay. Well, first of all, we took our inspiration, as the whole peace encampment did, from what was going on in England with the women's peace encampment. Uh, and so we started off quoting from a woman called Mandy from the Women for Peace and Animal Liberation Camp at Porton Down in England. And what Mandy said is, for myself, and I know other women here, the issue of animal rights and peace is inseparable. It's all a matter of attitudes toward the other living things around you. That's why this camp seems so important to us. It combines the two issues into a solid whole. And uh, Could I then, just say one thing about sure, Port yeah. Porton Down was a, a, a la chemical laboratory um, where they did experiments on animals and poison gas and things. Yeah, and later uh, in our time together, I'll talk about an update of that. I uh, did some research about whether that's still happening to animals today in the United States. And, um, and then we talked a little bit about our group. Uh, then the uh, poem that we used for one of the dances was called The Paradox, which at some point I would like to read. It was adopted from a poem by Anonymous. <laughs> in a book by Cleveland Amory called Mankind, Our Incredible War on Wildlife. Then Pat Finley and I did a dance to Aunt Leaf by Mary Oliver from her book Twelve Moons. And uh, then Beth re read her original poem called Woke Up Wonder. So who wants to go next? That was the overview. <laughs> Well, shall I begin with the poem? Yes. I have just a question. Yeah. How did, what was your process to, to put this together? Like as you guys were, if you remember, when you, how you were creating it when you. I think I it kind remember. of began. <laughs> I think it kind of got built up around the dance. Could I be. Because I remember Pat and I did a lot of work together in choreography, yes. the dances. Yes, and yeah. then uh, once the, the the dance established on the basis of the poem and then the poem giving us ideas and mm -hmm. and I can remember um, my mother and I came to uh, I think it was Pat Finley's house to have a little view of the dance beforehand oh. and it was a really nice experience um, just to kind of get a sense of you know you wanted a sense of what it would be maybe like to do it in front of other people and you know, so. It's like a dress rehearsal. Yeah, it's kind of like a little rehearsal. I have a bit of a funny story you reminded me of in terms of doing the dance ahead of time. I had forgotten about this, but Pat and I also did a preview of the dance Aunt Leaf for a friend of ours, Ed Kinnan, who is a great peace activist. In fact, he'll be going to jail again soon for a demonstration he did at the Supreme Court on behalf of people like Guantanamo. And um, <clears throat> so he's sitting there watching us, and we're doing our dance, and we said, well, what did you think of it? What did you mean? And he goes, I have no idea. I mean, it was nice to see these two women cavorting around, but I have no idea what you were trying to convey. <laughs> Is that a bit demoralizing? Did you go back and do a, a rewrite? Or a... <laughs> well, I think what we needed was we needed the, someone to read the poem, you and I think that's what you did. You <laughs> And as far as the group, did you all operate on consensus? Did you have different roles or leaders? Or how did you make decisions about things anyway before this? I don't remember being any disagreements. No. Do you? Yeah. No. I don't think decision making was difficult. It was pretty harmonious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everyone sort of, if they had something to say, they said it. And they had an idea, people could give their opinions and oh, go with sure. that idea versus yeah. somebody's idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I recall. Right. That was a long time ago. It was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
you are all feminists and, and involved in some kind of activism together at that point. Well, not around feminism per se. No, we no, were all involved but you were on all peace. feminists and yes. Well, so yes. when you came together, you were using maybe some parts of that feminist process that you and actually um, around that year was not that much later than my graduation from college. And it was really basically in my college years that I took some anthropology classes and had kind of this experience of, uh, you know, uh, kind of like the, the, the light went off about the situation of women in the world. It was almost like a, a religious ex experience in a sense of being shown about, you know, the, the condition of women worldwide in some of these anthropology classes and it wasn't that much longer after I had, was just in that awakening stage of learning and see, began, being able to recognize and seeing the political implications of being a woman in the world. So, you know, I guess I wasn't really actively involved in a feminist movement at that time, but I was in the process of awakening. And it was really easily clear to see what was happening with animals for me. Um, and the way I happened to meet Linda was I used to work in a theatrical uh, lighting company as a clerk. And she came in one day and that we sold stage makeup materials there. And she was saying, do you happen to have any makeup brushes that do not have seal fur, that, that have synthetic fiber? And I said, yes, <laughs> you care about that too. <laughs> you know? And that's how I met Linda. And she said, well, you know, we're thinking of starting a group um, on animal rights. Would you be interested? And it was like that very week that the, the first meeting took place. I Are you believe. part of the very first meeting? I believe so. I'm sorry, I had forgotten you were yes, right there at the yes, first one. Because well, then you're a founding mother as well. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it was that that very week that you know I said yes, I'll come. So. Oh wow. Well, That's how we met. And I remember you were wearing a pin. Maybe it was at work. I'm not sure that the one that says fifty nine cents for every dollar. Oh yeah. 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 So you were also educating me about yeah. issues having to do with women in the workplace. Right. And Jane, what about for you? What well, was I was in the affinity, women's affinity group um, that, that Susie was part of, and we met here at Info. So um, Even before? Even before the, this, yes. Oh. It was an ongoing group working on theories. What kind of stuff was that, like a consciousness uh, raising? Yeah, a consciousness raising group. How long well, you um Actually, I guess we sort of felt that our conscious, consciences, <laughs> consciousnesses had been, had been raised and we'd gone on to some further step. I'm not sure. Your post-consciousness <laughs> well. uh, uh, We were at, at least in the process. Um, and so this was just one thing that we did. Um, some people were working and some people went out west. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, the the Native American action that was at the at the same time out west big um, mountain big mountain of course yes so people various people were doing various things politically active in various yeah. issues yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah and so your and had you also been um, involved with animal rights during that whole time or was this um, sort of group new for you in that regard I I think anim, uh, par preceded this preceded well, it started in fall of 1982. When did we do the okay. presentation? Does anybody remember? It would have been 83, the summer of 83, I'd imagine. Yeah, it couldn't have been yeah. before 83, because that's when, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. so. But yeah. I can't remember when the affinity group started. Great, now wow. that gives us a good little sense of where you guys are at. Uh -huh. now, the history. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh -huh. Oh yeah, whatever, whatever. You were, you were getting ready to read it. Yeah. You're going to read your poem. <clears throat> okay. Oh wait, another thing. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I like to get the con the context of things. How did you come to write this poem? What was going well, on? the poem kind of explains how it came oh. to be written. It was just a very autobiographical experience, and. 
the poem will probably and and you know describe. Was it something though specific for this presentation? It was something you had already had and you brought to this process. Uh, I think I had it and possibly maybe had it in sketch form and then maybe developed it, but it's kind of fuzzy actually at this time. Okay, uh, okay. I won't interrupt. I promise. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sunlit summer mornings, summer afternoons of girlhood, when bold as a zinnia, bare-legged and curious, running through grasslands and circling nearby gardens, and quietly in the shadows hiding, stalking the jungle colors striped and dotted, afloat in exotic grace, paper streams and subtle breezes, a green net affixed to a wooden pole, captured a brilliance, scoops in some of the sky, a butterfly was caught. The act was not understood then, for its spell of exquisite wonder made my eyes too wide to see. Well, an old goat-faced woman with piercing eyes, deserted by her kids, scolded from her window with a gin-soaked voice that poked through a deep, resisting slumber. What are you doing out there? she nagged. I'm doing this for science, I defended. I'm studying Lepidoptera, larva, which emerge into pairs of broad membranous wings covered with very fine scales. Eh, yes, someday some giant will put you in a jar, she drooled. But I knew then the importance of school. And today I work in an office without windows and earn 59 cents for every dollar. So this poem was read and is dancing going on at the same time? No, not oh, dancing no. for this. No. It stood on its own. <laughs> Maybe you could butterfly your way around. <laughs> so you had that, you came to the encampment, you arrived on the land, Yes. and do you remember anything about arriving on the land? Was it what you expected? Well, I was, well, personally, I was a little bit scared, you know. I had never really done anything quite like this before. And I was a little scared, and I didn't know exactly what to expect. And when I first saw some of the women there uh, who were, you know, doing carpentry work and construction kinds of things, it, I had never seen women in, in, you know, such emboldened and, uh, I don't know, <laughs> but I was a little bit scared. But uh, Jane seems to have such a peace about her, so I kind of got calm just by looking at Jane. <laughs> so, but I do remember a little bit being scared. And you guys knew that you would arrive and then there would be some place for you to go or get ready to do something and people would gather and you would have an audience? That that was how you understood I remember people. being out in a field somewhere and I don't remember much of an audience. <laughs> but Beth thinks there were a number of people. Do I don't any have idea? any recollection of no one being there. I don't well, I mean, remember there somebody many people. Yeah. Yeah, many, many. And, uh, Maybe there were several things going on at the same time. I mean, some things. I think so. Some, some presentations sometimes went on in the barn, uh -huh. and there, there was just a lot of stuff happening there. Well, we, were we were outside. The pavilion? Yes, we were. Was the pavilion up at that time? I don't remember. I don't was remember. there a structure? A over structure? Oh no, 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 no. You were outside. Just out there, <laughs> right yeah. outside. And I do remember one woman who came from Potsdam because she joined People for Animal Rights Par. Uh, after seeing our performance, and uh -huh. she has rejoined every year since then. Oh. After all those years, she's a very loyal member. Wow. And she's kind of far away to ever come to anything, but apparently she feels some connection. Uh -huh. That's good. So if you don't remember, 
large number of people there. Do you remember any reaction to when you read that or how it felt to read it after preparing to read it? Well, once I got myself into this performance and, and experience, I was so absorbed in what we were doing that I didn't even have a sense of what was going on around me, really. I loved mm -hmm. some of the readings that we had picked out. We had a whole two-page uh, readings. Do you remember about the one that you did about the bird, looking at the bird and finding yourself transformed in flight in the, with the bird? Do you remember that? No, mm -hmm. maybe it was the bat. The one about no, the mother bat? No, no, it was about a bird. Mm -hmm. I have never felt so much 78 years old as I do at this moment. <laughs> That's right. I didn't remember any of those readings. I didn't even know he had done extra well, readings. I wish I knew what it was. But, uh, yeah. Um, but I just, and the dance was so beautiful. It was just... Mm. So I was just so absorbed in what the whole thing was, you know, I don't really have any peripheral... All I remember Vision is that, that one woman. That's all I remember. <laughs> Jane, do you remember arriving on the land? Had you had a? Oh, I think I had been there before. So yeah. I remember maybe the first time I went the night before my son, my high school age son, and I had picked a little starving, plucked a little starving kitten out of a raging Erie Canal. There was just a big rainstorm, and so the kitten. I had another cat or two at home, so the kitten was in a. And cat carrier, and I'd left her there for my son to take care of, and I was sort of anxious about that the whole time. That was another time, though, so I had been there at least once before. Do you have? Oh. I know you don't have any memory because you're 78, but if you did have a remnant, <laughs> then um, any images of first arriving or anything oh, you saw? Yeah. The little old farmhouse was very uh, attractive and um, in a sort of romantic kind of rundown sort of way. Lots of nice trees around. Lots of wonderful artwork and, and banners. And a quilt? Yes, yes. I remember quilt. Um, and I remember Karen being there a lot. Oh, okay, one thing, maybe I'll put this in now. Um, there was a mother cat there who had kittens. And um, you all remember this, I'm sure. And for a while, the mother cat wasn't doing very well and wasn't feeding the kittens. And I think Karen was the only one who picked up on this, really. She, she was living there. Um, uh, and, you know, got together some money um, and took the cat to the vet. And I was just looking through someone else's um, scrapbook here. This is Renee Noel Felice's. And there's a picture of someone who I know is the mother cat and not any kittens. And do you remember her name? No, I don't. <laughs> no. Oh, my God. It's a pretty cat. Do you yes. recognize the cat? I, no, I have to say I don't recognize the cat, but I think there was only one cat there. So At the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, and there were other times. Kittens. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Many cats. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> and were yes. they in good health and everything? Um, there were people who actually, one woman that we called the cat lady, Linda oh. Toss. <laughs> Oh, good. She so constantly good. sent money for the cats. Oh, and great. Hopefully to get them spayed and neutered. And oh. that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, good. but uh, sometimes people brought cats and <gasps> left them. Oh, oh, that happens oh. to rural people all the time. People yeah. Dump cats. Oh. Um, but, yeah, you know, I mean, all the things. The camp was a microcosm of society maybe, mm -hmm. you know, at times. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we did have, we had initially tripod the three-legged cat. Oh, wow. Benjamin tripod. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so how long were you there? Well, I, I started in 83 and continued. Um, I was there very consistently until 2006. Oh my wow. goodness. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I spent six years living on the land. Wow. But I do remember many cats. In fact, there is a cat burial oh. site at that Linda would come back oh. every year, and we would add the new <laughs> gravestones oh. to and mm -hmm. plant. She was planted bulbs and stuff. Oh. <laughs> cool. the one, the one I think we remember was the first cat, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Yeah. We actually have a photograph in the collection that we're going to put into our slideshow. I think it got taken out at the last minute, but. 
it's one of the wooden tables in the house, and there's a lineup of about seven cats all from behind. They're just sitting, and oh, that was in later years. That was like '86, '87, yeah. when it was more cats there than women. <laughs> <laughs> They were having their own meetings. Yeah, we call that yeah. The, the regional cat meeting. Yeah. Cat census. Yeah. There you go. Right. So why don't we come back to tell us what happened next, then we have the poem. Okay. Uh, well, next, um, I did a dance uh, myself that I had choreographed when I was in Boston, uh, taking a three-week workshop with something called the Wallflower Order. Has anybody ever heard oh, of the Wallflower my Order? Goodness. Of course. And uh, I was the oldest woman there at the, the three-week uh, workshop. And uh, I tell you, I realized that my body couldn't do all those things that those younger women could do. But I was able to choreograph this dance. And it was uh, the following poem called The Paradox. Tis strange how women kneel in church and pray to God above confess small sins and chant a praise and sing that he is love. While coats of softly furred things upon their shoulders lie, of timid things, of tortured things that take so long to die. They kneel and pray while wild trapped in tortured things take so long to die. They take so long to die. And so I was both the women and the animals in the steel jolly coal traps. Wow. And when you choreographed this dance, were you aware of this poem or you matched it? I did it to the poem. So even in your workshop, that was what you were doing? Right. Plus a lot of things they had us do. Right. It was quite an experience being there for three weeks. And you said you hadn't had any trouble. Well, <laughs> nothing professional. Well, <laughs> yeah. And so when you got to the encampment, you did the dance in the field as this was happening. Mm -hmm. And did you have some sort of costume that was a part of the dance or just came, came as you are? I don't remember what I was wearing. Probably whatever was comfortable to move in. Maybe tights with pants over them, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, Pat Finley and I had choreographed together a dance to Aunt Leaf by Mary Oliver from Twelve Moons. Do you want me to go into that, or did you have other questions first? And you guys, you all remember Jane reading this as this was happening? I think you were reading as we were did. dancing. I haven't prepared it now, so maybe I should. You won't read it. Well, you you know, maybe you'd rather read it. Well, um, you? You sure. probably were the one who read it then. Yeah, yeah it doesn't have to be prepared. I mean, just to have the words okay. in your voice would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Aunt Leaf by Mary Oliver. Needing one, I invented her. The great, great aunt, dark as hickory, called shining leaf, or drifting cloud, or the beauty of the night. Dear aunt, I'd call into the leaves, and she'd rise up like an old log in a pool and whisper in a language only the two of us knew the word that meant follow. And we traveled, cheerful as birds, out of the dusty town and into the trees where she would change us both into something quicker, two foxes with black feet, two snakes green as ribbons, two shimmering fish, and all day would travel. At day's end she'd leave me back at my own door with the rest of my family who were kind, but solid as wood, and rarely wandered. While she, old twist of feathers and birch bark, would walk in circles wide as rain, and then float back, scattering the rags of twilight on fluttering moth wings. Or she'd slouch from the barn like a gray opossum. Or she'd hang in the milky moonlight, burning like a medallion. This bone dream, this friend I had to have, this old woman made out of leaves. Oh, no way. That's not the end of it, right? Yes. yes. Oh, it's it great. Perfect. Wow. Talk about timing. Oh, nicely done, Jane. Yeah. Yeah. That was perfect. I thought we were in the middle. Yeah, that leaf herself. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Performance. I love this. <laughs> this is great. We're, we're getting such a wonderful variety of, of 
interviews with women, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like everybody gets asked the same questions and you each, it's, everyone is so different. It's going to be fantastic <laughs> for people viewing. It certainly is for getting an education of uh, who the people were who were at the encampment. So varied. Mm -hmm. So creative. Yeah, I look forward to seeing this. I wanted to um, bring us up to date on the way that animals are treated in labs to help us develop more horrible weapons or to try to protect ourselves from the horrible weapons that we and others develop. Um, we had, Jane had pointed out that at Port and Down in England, monkeys and other animals were being tortured with uh, chemical biological weapons back there in the 80s. And so to find out whether that was still happening and whether it was happening in the United States, I contacted In Defense of Animals, which is a national group in California. And a woman called Barbara Stagno, who's very helpful, did some research for me. I said, I want to know, you know, what kinds of animals and what are they subjected to, especially using our tax money. Our government is doing these experiments. And uh, so she found out, and uh, I will just mention a little bit of it. Uh, monkeys are the ones that are mostly being used in these experiments, but also rabbits, pigs, goats, guinea pigs, dogs, mice, and rats. And uh, this is part of the War on Terror. Uh, to test these biological chemical weapons. The biological weapons that are being tested are infectious diseases including anthrax, Ebola virus, Marburg, plague, rabies, and smallpox. And the chemical weapons include things like sarin, which is an extremely powerful nerve gas, and radiation. The commercial locations for many of these experiments carried out by the Department of Defense are Fort Detrick and Aberdeen Proving Ground, both in Maryland. And then she gave me some specifics um, of who's doing them and for how long they're funded. I'm only going to mention two out of the ones she gave me. One is for anthrax, plague, and tularemia on monkeys. It's funded from 2006 to 2011. The investigator is Zhang W. Chen. He's at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Another one is radiation experiments on dogs, funded from 2005 to 2009. The chief investigator is George E. Georges uh, at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center in Seattle, Washington. And she also included a description, which I'm not even going to give, of one of these experiments and what it did to the animals. But you can just imagine things like plague, mm. sarin, gas, and these living, feeling beings that have a right to their own life, to live a natural life, whatever is natural to that monkey or that dog or that mouse or whatever, are kept in these horrible labs and the only thing they have to look forward to is torture. Um, so I guess I'm in this battle for the rest of my life because whenever I'm reminded of these things it sort of like drives me crazy. Like sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I can imagine what it's like for that monkey who's in that stereotactic device where she can't even move. And uh, sometimes I just have to get up and move so I can say, well, I can move and I have to do what I can so that she can move. And that's all I have to say about that right now. So, <clears throat> you definitely had one woman who then signed up um, to get more news or to be part of the group, although she lived far away. Mm -hmm. Do you remember other women coming forward and, and being grateful for the information you presented or asking for materials to take back to their communities? I don't remember, but then again, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Uh -huh. <laughs> I remember a woman sitting there eating fried chicken from some place or something. I mean, you can't expect... <laughs> I couldn't expect our, our thing to, to be premature and keep her from buying fried chicken. <laughs> I just uh -huh. remember that. 
<laughs> this is the woman in the audience? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I mean, we hadn't head. converted her yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if I should mention the head injury lab. And, and well, measure whatever you want to. Yeah. Something else I did in my life with animals. Um, there was a terrible e experimental thing at the University of Pennsylvania head injury lab where they would cement the heads of macaques in helmets and ram them, con conscious, they were conscious, ram them into something and then the, the idea was to see what it did to their, their brains but with a hammer and chisel they would they would get the helmets off of them which would have invalidated even their hideous protocol. So PETA, the People, People for Ethical, the Ethical Treatment of Animals, in 1985 had a sit-in at the National Institutes of Health in Washington and I was part of that and sometimes I think that besides childbirth that was the most exciting <laughs> and creative experience I've ever had and we got the lab, we sat in, they, they, we went in and started with a subterfuge bringing a birthday cake or something, sat in, refused to leave um, and they made the dis the NIH made the decision that it would be less publicity if they let us stay there than if they called the police. That was a bad decision because there was a whole lot of publicity and the, the head of H Health and Welfare was a woman, luckily Margaret Heckscher, and she saw the films and was stunned and shut down the lab. Um, so th that was Yay. just a very exciting <laughs> experience. Uh -huh. That was after um, this at the Peace Encampment. And have both of you stayed involved with work that you were doing in the 80s in terms of animals, or have you moved on to other things, Beth? You want? Well, um, I have kind of moved on. Uh, truthfully, it's very, very hard to sustain the level of involvement for me. I just, it paralyzes me, you know. I. It's very difficult. But right now in my work, um, I work for an integrative medical uh, center. And in this center, there's a lot more honoring of Native American approaches to medicine. Even though the Native American ways of medicine are just as intricate and require as much investment of intellect and spirit and emotion that the Western paradigm would be. They don't include any dissection of any animals in the way they approach healing. And I'm seeing as a kind of positive thing that more and more people are beginning to seek other ways of healing. And there's a lot more interest and respect for the indigenous approaches using herbs and, and, and treating the earth with tremendous respect. It's, um, so that gives me, that's my little part of it still, mm -hmm. that um, I really encourage people to explore energy healing and, um, and also um, I'm involved with the Institute of Noetic Science which is an organization that attempts to merge science and spirituality. And with that kind of approach, too, there's a much more of a respect for the earth. So I think the paradigm shift is happening, that more people are kind of looking away from this kind of brutal approach to our wisdom, to a more ecological sense. And Jane, for you, is animal. Um, I'm not part. involved very much with PAR. Linda is just doing that almost single-handed, <laughs> as far no, as I can no, see. No, there. Yes, but people. anyway, it certainly wouldn't. Anyway, um, animals are very, very lucky. But um, I have been involved with my young grandson. Well, with both of my grandsons. And sometimes I have to remind various people that children are animals too. Um, but um, yeah, I just have not sustained it in anything.
Um, what does yeah. children or animals to me? Um, it just forget that. <laughs> forget forget that comment. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think a lot of times it's actually easier for people to be understanding of animals than it is for kids to, towards <laughs> children sometimes. Well, yeah. um, is that what you're getting at? Could that be? Well, sort of, of yes. When, when, <laughs> well, well, sometimes when I feel guilty for not being more involved in PAR, for example. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I see. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, Beth, for helping out. Um, and I, I have two cats. In my experience, cats always find you. You don't find them. <laughs> so I have two cats who live in two separate areas of my apartment. And then I'm finding homes for th this spring. I've been very much involved with three feral cats. And that's, that's coming to a good conclusion. One of them already has a place and I um, found out how to find, how to take care of the other two. So, um, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> what captures your imagination? Oh, yeah. Right. So then, then I have a question for you. Do you, and even, or both, all of you could speak to that, but kind of going back to Mandy's quote that you started off with in terms of a connection between peace and how, how we are with humans and war and how we are with animals. Is that something that you still feel or are connected to that idea that that is true for you and your understanding of it? Yes. As a matter of fact, I just wrote a brief essay that was in the um, newsletter of a local chapter of Peace Action in which I started off with a quote from Tolstoy, who was a vegetarian, and um, it's something to the effect that uh, as long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be uh, military graveyards. Mm. And uh, he felt that if we can't feel the pain of animals that we unnecessarily kill for food, that um, that allows a certain hardness of our hearts and lack of compassion and opens us up to be violent toward people. I don't think that necessarily follows because I certainly know a lot of peaceful, wonderful people who are not vegetarians and not every vegetarian or vegan is what I would consider a peaceful person in other ways. But nonetheless, in spite of those exceptions, I think there's a kernel of truth to what he had to say. So I sort of built on that for this brief article that was in there. And um, I'm still president of People for Animal Rights and probably will be to the day I die. Because <laughs> nobody else seems to be willing to carry that mantle. Um, I will do that work as long as I can because the need is still there. And the only way I could really be happy is to ignore the need, which I don't seem to have the ability to do, <laughs> or to do what I can to alleviate some of that suffering. Um, Several years ago, I was asked to teach a class at Syracuse University on this issue. And uh, Jane was one of my an guest speakers. Class. Yeah, an honors mm -hmm. class. Um, and she spoke about her experience that she's already shared with us at the sit-in at the National Institutes of Health. And I would have other speakers on other aspects of animal rights. And um, I tried to explain to the students that as a species, as a human species, our understanding of compassion has grown. We start off with this little kernel that maybe we just care about ourselves and our immediate family and then we start seeing a neighborhood and a nation and other nations and eventually I want this circle of compassion to include all species. So yeah, I still see the connection between peace and animal rights and also environmental protection. People for Animal Rights is an environmental protection group as well. And I also work with the local Sierra Club and the statewide Sierra Club. I'm chair of the statewide Sierra Club's biodiversity slash vegetarian outreach committee. Mm -hmm. So I do what I can in that capacity to bring the connection to uh, environmental activists. As I remember, that your course at SU was a very popular class, and after a couple of years, they shut it down, right? Probably yeah. the biology department did. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it only was one semester. Oh, really? And um, we were told to ask the students for written evaluation, and the per person who was my supervisor who asked me to do the class, he said, 
you can read the evaluations, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't know what people have to say. And all except, I guess there probably were like about 25 people, mm -hmm. all except two were very positive, and yet they didn't ask me to come back. And my theory about that mm -hmm. is that at one point when I was asking Jane to come and talk about animal experimentation and her experience, the supervisor said to me, um, our teacher of, I don't know, maybe it was biology, some kind of science that had to do with experimenting on animals, wants to have equal time to talk about why it's a good idea, why we have to do this experimentation. And I said, but I only have one class period on this topic. I can't have it shared with someone who's going to give another point of view when he has his whole class that I'm sure he's giving his point of view at every class he, he teaches. If you tell me to do it, I will do it. But if you're saying I have a choice, I'm not going to do it. And he said, oh, no, I won't tell you what to do. But I wasn't asked to come back. <laughs> so that's my theory of what happened there. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm curious, and since this is something you've been doing for such a long time, could you tell us, is it in your experience something that women predominantly think about or are working in this arena or is it mixed or is it really? I think it was mixed. Yeah, I think our local group certainly has had men who were very involved. Um, there, and I'm not sure of this because I don't, certainly didn't study it, but there may be a bit of sexism on a national level. I think that the national groups tend to have men in the high paying positions more than women. Except for PETA, of course. Except for PETA, where nobody gets paid much of anything. <laughs> and uh, Ingrid Newkirk is the most powerful person in that organization. So in terms of the movement or the act, that work, it's not predominantly male or female, not even in leadership, but just in terms of ranks. It's I, I don't know. An I, issue think, that, oh. I think it's women are more touched by that than, than men. I think they're more in touch with their nurturing aspect. That's my opinion. You're, you're not so sure about that, though. Well, I, I think that some of the organizations, I guess there has been one issue that I have taken up recently, and that is in the city of Auburn, where I'm now living. There's been some massive um, migrations of crows, and resulting from that, there was a, someone in the community that started a crow hunt each year. And there was a small group of us that kind of protested about this crow hunt. And fortunately, the crow hunt has stopped. I don't know if, uh, you know, not only did this small group make some protests about the way in which this hunt was taking place, but we also, in our community, had a series of poetry readings um, that that we're you know we had a whole reading about crows and and I just I think it kind of lifted people wow. to the point of thinking this is an amazing phenomenon yeah. that we have you know and uh, there hasn't been the hunting part I mean there's still some disgust about oh darn the crows <laughs> you know your windshields and you know uh, <laughs> but uh, there's been a softening I think in the community towards towards it and, and kind of a pride that, you know. So I think that that um, he had both men and women involved in that uh, pro-crow kind of <laughs> movement there in Little Auburn, New York. Cool. So. What's your thinking about that question? <clears throat> I was just thinking a lot of the, the heads of groups like Wayne Pacelli, who's the, the HSE, Humane Society of the United States, is a wonderful activist and is starting to spend some of the huge amounts of money that, that um, those groups sometimes amass. Um, I, I don't have a sense. Mm -hmm. I think Ingrid Newkirk is by far the most um, fire-eating, effective person in, in, um, in animal rights, but I, I, I don't have a sense of statistics. Really. So we just have a few minutes. Is there anything that you guys didn't get an opportunity to say or memories or thoughts that deal with the encampment or? Well, it is the issue of the white deer. Oh, if, if, yes. if no. Yeah, um, um, they're 
white deer, a captive pop when they, uh, when the army took over this um, land from the town of Varick. Apparently there were a lot of, um, a disproportionate number of deer who had white genes and so of course they interbred. And people have been just wanting to hunt them for a long time. There have been, uh, lately there were a lot of meetings, 20, um, 25 groups or people spoke out, um, 24 of them for, uh, one for, for canned hunting and 24 of them for not. Um, I talked to the, um, the head of the Seneca County Industrial Development Authority, which was, de which was started to, to um, administer this land. And she says that the Army has until at least 2012, possibly much later than that, to do the, envir the environmental cleanup. So the whole thing is, is moved until then. For some reason, the Army hasn't had terribly much money lately. So um, <laughs> I wonder why. Wonder why. Who, knows? <laughs> who knows when that will happen. But meantime, there's every year they have, I'll just say one more thing, they have culling, which of course means killing. And everyone claims that this has to happen to, to maintain the herd. Um, and it's run strictly by the Army. And this is one, one time I really do appreciate the Army, I think. Um, their rules, the only, it's a lottery, but the only people who can come in and shoot the deer are present Army personnel or retired Army personnel. So at least they're going to know how to shoot something one would hope, uh, and, and possibly actually kill the animal quickly. And it's the, the quota is done proportionally, um, white, um, no more white deer than in the proportion to the herd. And the hunters have to stand on what they call a little igloo, and they can't move from there. Oh, first there's a helicopter attempt at a count, and they can't move from their igloos, so it's not a, a band of um, rabid know nothing um, people at least and there's there's time for this issue to be sorted out. I could add something to that and that is that even though people who um, think that hunting wild animals is a, a good management tool there are other choices for example there's immunocontraception which have been used on deer especially that works in enclosed areas which oh, we're right. talking about yeah. an enclosed area as far as I know, they haven't even considered that. And one of the proposals for the Seneca Army Depot in its next incarnation is to have paid canned hunts where these animals, especially the white deer, would be great trophies for people to kill, to be able to put over their mantelpiece. But a man called Peter Muller, who's with the group uh, committee against, uh, a committee to abolish sport hunting, cash, he came up with a financial analysis of how much more money the community around there could make by having um, environmental tours of the area, because it's not just deer, all sorts of animals live there now, there's a lot of biodiversity, um, people taking pictures and so forth, making more money that way than with the canned hunts. So I hope that some people in position of influence took that in. <laughs>
So I said, hey, we, you know, we got to get down under the bushes so they can't see us. So, so we ended up getting down and eventually we were like down on our bellies, crawling underneath bushes. And then each time, and then we would wait while the helicopter passed overhead, hoping they wouldn't see us <laughs> with our bright colors. <laughs> and then when they circle around, then I say, "Okay, go." And then we go and run or crawl or whatever. And then when they came back, you know, we'd say, "Okay, stop." And we'd go under a bush so they wouldn't see us. After a couple of times of this, I noticed, and several of the other women did too, that each time we stopped, we heard rustling and crawling through the bushes behind us. <laughs> And I'm like, after the second or third time of hearing this wrestling, I'm like, hey, so, yeah, because we could talk loud because we just didn't want to be seen. I'm like, hey, somebody's following us. You hear that? And the other one, like, yeah, what is that? You know, and, and I, we didn't know if we were going to be like shot at or tear gassed or what. So we just, you know, kept going. And each time we stopped, we heard this wrestling <laughs> behind us. And finally, we got to the edge of the forest. There was like about a, what, a hundred foot clearing from the forest to the um, to the um, barbed wire and um, what's it? Wire. razor wire fencing, which was by the airstrip because our mission was to go over the fence and set down little um, little containers of herbs and spider plants because we were converting the airstrip to a um, peaceful to a, um, a nursery. nursery. Yeah, yeah, to a nursery. That was our mission. So, okay, so we get to the edge of the forest and then we have to like run really fast up to the fence, throw the carpeting over. And while I'm doing that, I look behind me and here comes a whole newspaper and camera crew. It was the guy from the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, the main newspaper in Rochester. He and his crew had been following us through the brush and they were doing the rustling behind us. So they're the ones that have the picture of us going over the fence without carpeting and helping each other climb over and then the ones who were assigned to go over the fence and run to the airstrip and put down the um, containers to convert the airstrip to a nursery. I was sort of huddled under the helicopter. And, um, I have a on, the, on the airstrip, yeah, on once the you airstrip. got over, yeah. I have a correction. It was Susie that remembered about the reporter and the photographer, <laughs> which is why she's, we persuaded her to come and tell me. Right, so, th so that's my addition and uh, the part now. <laughs> <laughs>